Hi there, and welcome to BNM Bloomberg's special coverage of the 2023 federal budget. I'm John Olupin. Great to have you with us as we await the finance minister, Chrystia Freeland, tabling this year's budget. There are some big economic uncertainties on the road ahead, worries about a banking turmoil story we've been covering closely recently and the recessionary risks, but also worries about continued spending out of Ottawa. So we could see some signs of fiscal restraint given the inflationary concerns, but also some steps taken to address those those inflation concerns from all Canadians, perhaps some uh, fresh help there, and also the road ahead on competing with the United States, particularly when it comes to the green economy. A lot to digest, and we're going to have a wonderful panel of guests to walk you through it all as we cover this year's federal budget. But to set the stage, we are joined now by BNM Bloomberg anchor Paul Bagnall, who has been looking into all the specifics to be watching for. Paul. Yeah, I'll give you a view of uh, what uh, budget watchers and one leading Bay Street economist, John, are expecting in this budget. And indeed, Finance Minister Christia Freeland has a challenging task ahead of her in this uh, budget, how to balance the need to stay competitive with the United States in terms of providing encouragement and incentives to businesses developing green energy technology technology, how to assist uh, Canadians at the lower end of the income spectrum who are being hurt by uh, rampant inflation, and at the same time, how, not, how to avoid fueling further inflation by overspending in the budget. So here's something that Christia Freeland said earlier this month when she was uh, speaking to various groups on the upcoming budget. This one uh, came uh, during a, a talk to a uh, labor union, and she said one of our primary goals in this year's budget is to not pour fuel on the fire of inflation. And so there have been signals from the government and from the finance minister that fiscal restraint will be a part of this package. I'll tell you in a minute what an economist is, is expecting in terms of our debt to GDP ratio coming out of this budget. In the meantime, let's go to what Rebecca Young, she's an economist at Bank of Nova Scotia is expecting in terms of new spending. She expects to hear plans for $50 billion in new spending over the five-year horizon of the budget to be announced less than half an hour from now. She expects that to be broken down into roughly $20 billion on health care. Keep in mind the government's already announced a big agreement with provinces. We're expecting to essentially hear that restated later today. $22 billion on a clean economy package, and that is that uh, uh, importance of uh, fostering the uh, development of uh, new energy technologies, particularly when the United States is uh, offering major incentives to players there. And finally, $8 billion on other priorities, which would include, we understand, several measures to help people most affected by inflation. Quickly, here's her big picture look at the fiscal picture, what she expects uh, to see. Uh, she says the fiscal path would deteriorate modestly but not substantially uh, in this budget. She sees net federal debt at 42% of gross domestic product through fiscal 2044 and then declining to 38%. And that, by a significant margin, John, will be the lowest net debt to GDP ratio among G8 nations. And we've obviously been covering very closely all that new money coming south of the border through the Inflation Reduction Act and a lot of conversations around what we could see here. And specifically, the big oil producers wanting to get more clear Clarity on the possible expansion of the tax credit for carbon capture technology. Is that correct? Yeah, and that is expected. It is contentious that uh, that credit does have its critics as well, who do, do who think that major oil producers should not re be receiving tax credits from the federal government. But they are working on carbon uh, capture technology. There has been a tax credit in place, and we are expecting to see that tax credit expanded as part of, as one of several measures intended to promote the development of green technology here in Canada. Paul. Thank Thank you so much, and we will check in with you a little bit later. That's Paul Bagnall. Let's dig into some of these budget themes. We've got a great panel joining us for our program today here in studio. Entrepreneur Nicole Verkent, who founded supply chain platform OMX, which has since been acquired. She's now the CEO of grocery and delivery app Buggy. Carol Stevenson, also with us as an executive. She rose to become CEO of Lucent Canada. She's a longtime corporate director, currently on board, such as GM and Maple Leaf Foods. She was also dean at the University of Western Ontario's Ivy Business School. And we are also joined by Sean Spear who was an advisor to former Prime Minister Stephen Harper. He is now a senior fellow at the Public Policy Forum and editor-at-large of The Hub. It's like we got the gang all back together again. This is wonderful. Sean, you're our <laughs> fiscal expert. So you just heard what Paul said about um, what we are likely to, to, to see. Does that get a check mark from you? 
Yeah, I think the big question uh, in, the, in the coming hours, uh, John, is this question of fiscal restraint. Um, what listeners or viewers may not appreciate is actually the government has restraint embedded in its own fiscal estimates moving forward. Let me give you a couple of numbers. For the first five years of the Trudeau government, I'm referring to the period prior to the pandemic, average program spending grew by 6.4% per year. That's pretty significant annual growth, outstripping economic growth or inflation or other common economic metrics. For the next five years, uh, the government's projecting spending growth of just 2.4%, so less than half of the annual growth that we saw in the first five years. That's going to take a lot of restraint relative to past performance. And, And as you know, John, there's a ton of pressures facing the government, not just some of the policy ones Um, that Paul mentioned, but also political ones. We're operating in a minority parliament. The government is relying on ongoing support from the new Democrats, which who have their own uh, spending priorities. So it seems to me one of the key tests for the government's um, uh, ability to hold the line on spending is whether we see a significant increase in the spending growth profile over the next five years. If it's not 2.4 percent, what is it? Is it closer to the 6.4 we saw in the past? or some number less than that. If so, um, then, uh, then the government can actually claim um, that, it's, that it's sort of found uh, Damascus, so to speak. Mm. And, and we should point out, I mean, I, I mentioned this inflation reality. The fact that there is inflation has helped the fiscal picture, at least for now. Uh, and we could hear more about some assistance for hard hit Canadians. Carol Stevenson, uh, confidence, obviously, among everyone in this country is important, but also in the boardroom. Uh, what can you share about the confidence that there may be in, in, in whatever roadmap we're looking at here fiscally in this country? Well, I think what's very important is clarity. Um, We have been waiting for this budget, um, wondering what um, the forecast is going to be on spending, uh, on new programs, et cetera, and uh, are there tax credits for certain industries, certain investments. And companies tend to not invest as much until they see clarity, uh, including uh, the tax regime for corporations. So uh, I I think the biggest uh, thing that most of the people that I know in boardrooms are looking for is clarity on direction, industrial strategy. Uh, Have we picked some particular uh, aspects of the economy that uh, we want to invest in? Those would be the top two things that I uh, think people are waiting to hear. All right, Nicole, I'll bring you into the conversation. As uh, the head of a business, you've got to make these decisions day to day. What, what, What are you thinking about today on this budget day? Well, beyond clarity, all we all I heard earlier was about spending. So how do we incentivize business leaders and entrepreneurs to make those investments? We're seeing the data come out. We've known about this for a long time. We have a huge productivity issue in Canada, which scares me because it's a leading indicator for the long term. So how do we incentivize more investment in R&D, which is something that takes a long time to see the benefits from. So um, I'd like to see, and some of those even non-monetary items, so reducing regulatory burden, that can show up in a budget as well. Um, And some of these items that we've been talking about, but have been hard to do because of the crisis of COVID. Um, So how do we start to layer those in and start to connect the dots of, how do we pay for all of this stuff? We have a huge wish list of things we have to pay for. We have a healthcare system that needs a lot of funding. How do we pay for that? The only way, I know a lot of these listeners at BNN, is, is how do we grow business? Yeah, and Sean Spear, I mean, there's gonna be a lot of focus today. Paul was telling us about it earlier on how we are going to compete with the United States on that issue that Nicole was talking about, being competitive within the green economy. Could we lose sight, though, to Nicole's point, on other areas, because there might be so much focus on the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S. and Canada's response to that? I think there's something to that. Nicole hits the nail on the head. Um, Projected growth in budget 2022 over the next five years is a measly 1.7%. We need to get that number up, um, not just because of the positive economic Mm -hmm. outcomes that that represents for Canadians, but also because it's fundamental to the government's own fiscal plan. Um, And so I think the the focus on growth will be a, a key test for this government. Is it able to rebalance the way it's thought and talked about um, budgeting in the past several years to a greater focus on the issues that Nicole's raised. I, that's an open question, as I say, just is its commitment to, to spending restraint uh, in, in, in the areas of, of federal jurisdiction that, uh, as you know, there are just a ton of demands uh, f- facing this government. 
Carol Stevenson, um, let's talk about taxes, shall we? I, I'm not sure that we're going to see any tax cuts uh, today, but we'll find out. Uh, certainly Quebec took a look at that, at least with uh, some of, uh, uh, of the people in their province, as, as something to consider. Um, on the subject of taxes, whether it's what individuals are paying or what companies are paying, what should we be thinking about as all these headlines cross over the next hour or two? Well, I think it depends on the spending. I mean, if we suddenly decide we're going to spend a lot more on programs, we all know that the carrying costs of that are much higher uh, for government. And in order to pay for all of this, they have to generate revenue. And how do you get revenue? Well, taxes is one way, or growth um, is another way. So I, I think it depends on spending. Uh, and if they don't, um, increase programs then at a, a higher clip than expected, then I don't think we should be uh, doing a lot with taxes. Uh, and if we were to do something on taxes, this will be controversial, but I would go after the GST. It's a consumption tax. Um, I know it, it's unpopular because it increases costs as you purchase something that it might tamper inflation a little bit, but I, I don't think we can have a lot of increased spending without figuring out a way to pay for it, given that the cost of debt is so high right now that um, something's got to give here. It's either strategic choices on what we spend on or it's about um, raising revenues uh, in some form or fashion to, uh, to pay for it. The balancing act for sure. We'll be watching all those details. We're so looking forward to having all of you with us through this federal budget to get your reaction. And we're going to stay with that coverage coming up. But we also do, of course, want to get back to the story of markets. We've got that to cover as well. And we're going to be joined by BMO's chief market strategist, Brian Belsky, as the market day continues. And the countdown to federal budget 2023 also continues here on BNM Bloomberg. Welcome back to BNM Bloomberg's special coverage of the 2023 federal budget. I'm John Ehrlichman, and of course, we're going to be covering all those details coming out of Ottawa as we roll into next hour. But it is a trading day. We do want to get a quick update on how things have been playing out on Bay Street and Wall Street. Joining us with his market outlook, Brian Belsey, chief market strategist at BMO. And always great to see you, Brian. And uh, happy budget day here in Canada. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, the market seems calmer a little more stability uh, today, uh, and yet it seems like investors are, are facing the same kind of questions that people like the finance minister in Ottawa are feeling uh, right now, which is, is there a, a recession on the horizon? Do I want to be long equities in a time of uncertainty now that we seem to have had a moment to breathe during this banking turmoil? What's your view? Well, good afternoon, Canada. It's wonderful to see you, John. It's, I'm humbled to be on with you. And uh, hello from cold, rainy San Francisco. In fact, I think it might be colder here than it is in Toronto. But um, I, I'll say this, the what if question, what if there's a recession? Is there going to be a recession? When is the recession? There's so much obsession with the recession timing of this, John, that we're kind of forgetting uh, the formula of investing. You know, stocks, lead earnings, which lead the economy. We're so focused on the economy, we kind of forgot that the stock market, at least in the United States, was down 26%, peaked to trough last year in terms of, of the pullback. And that already told you, the stock market already told you that we're gonna have a recession at some point. And so the market itself is obviously um, so momentum driven, so short term driven, especially the last few years with all the liquidity that has been pushed into the system. And now it, it just really feels to us, and this is really our theme for 2023, that the market is settling down. We are returning to normalization in terms of stock prices and the way that the market is trading. We still have to unwind what's going to happen with earnings and still have to unwind what's going to happen with the economy. And that's a process. And it's going to take a while. And all this noise, especially with the potential crisis in the banking system, remember, crisis usually happens at the end of a bear market. So that actually is, is a really good point that I think people are missing. And I think we're really coming to fruition that 
you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater in terms of financial stocks and certainly the banks in the United States. It was, from our lens, uh, very limited uh, to, the, to those bad apples. And I think the market's come to the census. You know, it's interesting that you say all of that. The fact that the S&P 500 has been in a bear market for almost 15 months at this point, it's on track if this continues before we get a, an official recession call. This could be the longest pre-recessionary bear market that we have seen. Um, I guess the question, Brian, is if you're looking for places to be right now, everybody's got a different opinion. Tech stocks were rallying recently after their struggles. They're pulling back a little bit today. Some people say, look, sit on the sidelines, go into short-term bonds for now. What's your view on how to position in, in a market where there there has, to your point, been some selling pressure, but there's still uncertainty. Well, you know, for the record, we don't think we've been in a bear market. We think the market bottomed in, in October, and we think that was the start of the new bull market, by the way. We still think that U.S. stocks are in the midst of a 25-year secular bull market, where you actually can see down in flat years like we've seen a couple of times since this bull market, the big secular bull market started in 2009, by the way. And so what we're trying to do now is decipher what the new leadership's going to be. Unfortunately, tech um, has had uh, this new push in it because of liquidity. If you think about why tech's been working recently, especially during the banking system woes, that, that the tech sector and the big tech stocks benefited from liquidity, number one. Number two, in the January rally, it was really a low-quality rally, and people went and bought the oversold tech stocks and stuff that was really beaten up in 2022. That's not new leadership. New markets are never uh, defined by old leadership. We think the new leadership for the next three to five years is going to be growth at a reasonable price, value, high quality, and oh, by the way, stock picking, not macro. You know, we started this discussion today trying to think about this and, and define this obsession with the recession. And so we are way, we meaning the investing community, is way too focused on macro, way too fear laden, laden. And we've forgotten that the stock market is a market of stocks, Jonathan. And I think that even in Canada, especially in Canada, we got amazing stock names that we can pick in terms of companies. Mm. And it's not just buying the banks or buying the metal or buying tech. It's about buying stocks, Jonathan, and I think that's really what's going to define the next three to five years. Brian, great to have you back with us. Enjoy a cool day in San Francisco. We appreciate your time <laughs> as always. Brian Belsky, Chief Market Strategist at BMO, joining us. And of course, we are getting ready for the Finance Minister, Christian Freeland, to table this year's federal budget. We'll be back with more in the lead up to the big show in Ottawa. We've got a great panel. We'll be right back. Okay, our lead up to the federal budget continues with a great panel. Tech CEO Nicole Verkent is back with us, along with corporate director Carol Stevenson and fiscal policy expert Sean Spear. And we're going to do a quick whip around, gang. Um, Nicole, I'm going to start with you. Affordability is front and center. You run a business where this issue of stuff you're getting at the grocery store is front and center right now. What are you thinking about? Yeah, it's absolutely top of mind. It's all everybody's talking about. And unfortunately, you have to eat, you have to buy groceries. And I think the thinking is that there'll be another GST rebate, and that's the way they're going to handle it. I think the ironic part about that is GST is on so few grocery items. But mm. um, it's a, I, if they had to deal with it, to me, I'm okay with that way because you're not handpicking certain items and increasing the price on certain items or decreasing the price on certain items, and that will actually cause more inflation. So, um, But definitely it's going to be top of mind for today's budget. I think Canadians are going to want to see something on that topic. And Sean, Sean Spear, we know that this government wanted to address affordability and those who feel hardest hit by inflation, but you just laid out the fiscal realities for us before the break. Yeah, exactly, John. It seems to me uh, a signal of higher and more spending is just going to make the job of the Bank of Canada even tougher. Um, and so, well, there may be some sy symbolic nods. I think anything more than that um, risks creating a, you know, something of an inflation spiral. Just one other point on this subject, John. Um, the government is in the process of entering into collective bargaining negotiations across um, the, the federal government. And it seems to me one thing I'll be looking for in this budget is any signals about the wage mandate that it's going to be pursuing. If Ottawa gives in to big increases in wages uh, for federal unions, you know, again, that's the kind of thing that can start to create a price wage spiral and increasingly make it difficult for the Bank of Canada to wrestle 
inflation under control. So both on the spending side, but also the federal government as an employer are two key ways in which it can influence our way out of uh, of, of this period of high inflation. This is no small detail you're highlighting with, I believe now, upwards of 336,000 federal employees, an increase of about 30 percent since Justin Trudeau took office. Carol Stevenson, last word, at least for now, over to you because you sit in boardrooms. How big of a concern is this lingering inflation uncertainty? Well, it's about affordability, consumer affordability, and that's the lingering concern because if uh, if people can't afford to buy things, um, then it's very tough on, on pretty much any industry. Uh, but back to your grocery question for a moment. Um, I agree with Nicole. They may expand the GST or extend the GST rebate, but I think the worst thing that they could do would be similar to what they did uh, to the banks in the last budget, where they pick an industry, call it the grocery industry, and say, we're going to put some sort of tax on you. Um, because when you actually look at the profits of the um, grocery industry, they're not, they haven't grown increasingly high. It's uh, a lot of the costs that are driving this, right. which gets passed to consumers. So, you know, I think, uh, I think we have to be very cautious in reacting or overreacting to what's a very popular thing to complain about these days. Nicole, you're, you're nodding your head because you're, <laughs> you're, you're dealing with this a lot right now. Well, it's tempting for me to want the government to put this windfall tax on the big grocers because maybe that would be helpful to me. But I, I completely agree with Carol. I think that would be that would really destroy the trust between business and government. You know, you have to invest a lot of money up front. It takes a long time sometimes to make a profit in a business. And then to just have this windfall tax put on you because you've had a year where there's been inflation, huge supply chain disruptions, lots of reasons um, for the prices going up. And I think we just have to stick with it. Increasing interest rates takes a while to see the impacts of that. And we right. have to stick with it. And we're already seeing... Uh, coming down. But yeah, windfall tax would be scary to me. Okay, John, helpful context. Nicole John, Burkin, John, uh, I'm going to have to leave it there, but I've got plenty of time for you, my friend. Trust me, we're going to be going through <laughs> the, the budget details as we roll into the next hour. And of course, we're going to have the closing bells on Bay Street and Wall Street. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Here joining me in studio, entrepreneur Nicole Verkent, who founded supply chain platform OMX, which has since been acquired. She's now the CEO of grocery and delivery app Buggy. Carol Stevenson, also with us as an executive. She rose to become CEO of Lucent Canada. She's a longtime corporate director currently on board, such as GM and Maple Leaf Foods. She was also dean at the University of Western Ontario's Ivy Business School. And we're also joined by Sean Spear, who was an advisor to former Prime Minister Stephen Harper. He is now a senior fellow at the Public Policy Forum and editor-at-large of The Hub. Thank you all for being with us as part of our budget special here on BNM Bloomberg. And we're awaiting those specifics out of Ottawa. Sean Spear, I know you were very hungry as we rolled into this hour to talk a little <laughs> bit more about what to be thinking about. The, I'll give you the first word. Yeah, th thanks for that, John. We've spent um, the period so far leading up to the, the budget's release focused on some of the big picture items, climate policy, the, the fiscal track, um, inflation, growth, etc. But of course, these documents are huge and embedded in them contain all sorts of measures that oftentimes don't spill out into the public for, for days or weeks after. One that was in last year's budget that I just want to flag for viewers because I think we're going to learn a little bit more about it. It was a commitment to establish an alternative, uh, pardon me, a minimum tax threshold. Uh, the idea, uh, John, was that uh, they wanted to protect against people using different tax credits or preferences to lower um, their tax owing uh, in the name of making sure that we don't have a Warren Buffett problem. You know, that is his, his secretary paying higher tax rates than him. I think we're going to learn more about that today, and that could have big implications for a lot of a, a lot of your viewers. So I, I would encourage people in the days and weeks to follow us to be checking out some of these smaller measures that could have uh, big consequences for our economy. 
uh, and for investors. Carol Stevenson, maybe I'll get your perspective more broadly speaking on something like an alternative minimum tax that Sean is referencing here, which, you know, in many ways, there, there's been this feeling that, um, to Sean's point, people weren't necessarily, the government wasn't able to uh, see those with the means to pay their fair share. It seems the challenge, though, with something like this is sometimes people, for any financial reason, like maybe you sell a cottage as we take a look at the uh, finance minister standing, uh, and uh, we are awaiting some of those details. But uh, I will, uh, as, as we await some more specifics, Carol Stevenson, just on the idea of the alternative minimum tax, um, your thoughts on that? Well, I see the uh, ministers in the color green. Is it the color of money? <laughs> uh, but anyway, <laughs> on to uh, alternate minimum tax. I think we actually have one. And I think what they're, they were looking at, and Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, was revised. And Carol, I just want to let you know that the embargo has lifted on the federal budget. So we're awaiting some of these details to now roll out tied to the budget as the finance minister uh, is providing her testimony. But we're going to go through those details as we get them here. Uh, but uh, so Sorry, I'll, I'll go back over to you for a second here, Carol. Go ahead. Well, I was just saying, I think they're going to revise the alternate minimum tax, which isn't a bad thing. Um, the, the one thing, though, um, Sean, you're right about the fine details, is sometimes there are unintended consequences of some of these small items. And for example, we'll charitable contributions. There have been some very big, wonderful, generous donations to hospitals, universities, et cetera. You know, Carol, um, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm just going to let you know, I, I, I am seeing a couple of headlines here about the fiscal picture, specifically that this uh, liberal government sees a deficit of $43 billion for the 2022-2023 year. Uh, we did expect a, uh, going back to the fall economic update, a $36 billion um, uh, yeah. Uh, deficit, uh, which was obviously at the time seen as a, a vast improvement it would create to what was previously new expected. Uh, but uh, that headline just crossing on the fiscal um, reality for the country. Um, there is a um, $40 billion uh, deficit that seems to be uh, planned for 2023, 2024. Uh, so obviously for a lot of people who are trying to figure out the road back to balanced books, that is a consideration right now. Just to go through some of the specifics. Up, yeah, go ahead, Sean. That that projection for 23, 24, the current, the upcoming fiscal year, that's up $10 billion from the, the yeah. fall economic statement. So yeah. that kind of comes back to my point earlier that there's a question here about whether the government sticks to its path or right. we see it deviate from its path, which, which if it does, it brings into question its ability to kind of hold the line sure. on this message of so-called restraint. And I'm just going to go through some of the details here. So uh, just to reiterate, the deficit for the fiscal year uh, ending this week grows to $43 billion, uh, 1.5% of GDP from that $36 billion that uh, the finance minister had forecast back in her November budget update. And then by 2027-28, the government expects a shortfall of a shortfall of $14 billion instead of the $4.5 billion surplus it previously projected. So interesting developments there for those who are awaiting balanced budgets in this country. Federal debt is a proportion of GDP, which obviously when the case is made for spending, this has come up in recent years. Uh, that will climb to 43.5% in the fiscal year that begins April 1st from 42.5% this year. It is expected to decline to 42.2% in 2025 through 2026 and 39.9% by the end of the forecast cast horizon. Uh, the revenue projections, and obviously we talked a little with our panel about what you can expect, those are down more than $5.5 billion on average per year from the November budget update. And that does reflect some of these economic uncertainties, at least from the vantage point of the federal government that we've been talking about. Um, given that there are still elevated levels of inflation, uh, some concerns obviously for what that could mean or I should say the economic outlook, what that means for the commodity prices in this country. Uh, it would seem that risks to the projection are tilted to the downside. Uh, we did talk a little bit earlier about some of the new spending on health transfers to provinces, which was something we were going to watch for. And then on the clean energy front, incentives that will cost upwards of $20.9 on the forecast horizon. And we know that that was something that a lot of people were curious about in response to what we saw with the U.S. Uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Those are just a couple of the headlines, but I do want to bring in BNM Bloomberg's Paul Bagnall, who has more details on the fiscal picture outlined by the
federal government. Paul. Lots of detail, John. Uh, the government is projecting a deficit uh, of $43 billion this year. The government is also forecasting a debt-to-GDP ratio uh, climbing in the current fiscal year to 43.5% and then declining at the end of the five-year budget horizon to 39.9. Now, those are higher numbers than were forecast by a Bank of Nova Scotia economist, uh, Rebecca Young, what we talked about earlier today. However, that both of those numbers clearly put Canada at the bottom of the G8 in terms of the uh, uh, purport, the, uh, the uh, size of uh, net debt versus the GDP of the country. Other countries in the G8 have much, much higher debt loads proportionate to their uh, to their gross domestic product. Revenue projections are down uh, almost $6 million, $6 billion, specifically $5.7 billion. That's the decline in uh, expected revenue to the government on a weaker economy. When the economy slows down, and we know that it has recently, uh, revenue to the government declines, and it's expected to decline this uh, fiscal year by $6 billion. New spending on health care to provinces and expanded dental care totals $31.3 billion over six years. So there you get uh, that agreement with the provinces on expanded health care transfers and uh, the pledge with the uh, New Democratic Party, the NDP, on dental care. Again, $31.3 billion over six years. Clean energy incentives, another major theme in this budget, will total almost $21 billion over the uh, uh, forecast horizon, six years. Uh, that is, those are some of the big, big takeaways here. There is a grocery credit here, uh, uh, John, as well. I'm not sure I've got those details details right in, in front of me, but there is something uh, to uh, to uh, support uh, people in the grocery aisles. Here it is. Now, just let me open this up. Uh, the uh, well, A one-time grocery rebate to provide $2.5 billion in targeted inflation relief. So there's the third major theme of this budget. One is uh, the clean energy uh, support. One is expanded health care spending. And the third, as we expected, was support for Canadians affected by most affected by inflation. That's coming in the form of a one-time grocery rebate. It will total $2.5 billion. Paul, thank you for those very helpful breakdowns. And I do want to get to some other specifics that I know our BNM Bloomberg audience is going to be very interested in. We talked earlier with our panel about targeting wealthier Canadians, uh, as well as the constant look at the banks uh, and their contributions. We've got a couple of updates here. First of all, in a measure that uh, officials build as closing a loophole, uh, Canada will begin treating dividends received by financial institutions from holding domestic shares as business income. They anticipate, the federal government that is, uh, they expect that will bring in more than $3 billion over five years starting in 2024. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to just get to is the alternative minimum tax, which our guests were talking about before this budget news broke. What would the federal government do? Uh, and there have been these proposed changes to the AMT that will apply to some Canadians earning more than $300,000 annually, specifically the hike in the special tax rate to 20.5%. It had been 15%. Uh, so uh, not only that, it comes with a fourfold increase in the income level at which it begins to apply. And the government expects that will generate $3 billion over five years. And we want to go into more details around that and get our uh, guest reactions to it. But Bloomberg's Brian Platt has spent the day in the lockup covering all of this for Bloomberg News. And he joins us now with more on his own reporting on what has come out of this. Brian, I'm going to have to start with what I just outlined there, because obviously a lot of people on Bay Street and people who are tuning into BNM Bloomberg are going to be very curious about what message the government is sending with this. What would you say? Well, uh, th this is not the first time they've done this, right? In a, in a budget, if they if they want to raise a bit of revenue, what they have done in the past is they raise uh, taxes on financial institutions and on wealthier Canadians. And so we're not talking about huge numbers here necessarily in the, in the, in the, in the uh, total context of the budget here, but uh, they've once again, that is, that is what they've done on the revenue side. Uh, is uh, um, ch what they're calling chain closing a loophole, as you call as you called it, on uh, dividends uh, and financial institutions 
and the alternative minimum tax. Both of these, if I recall, uh, the, the money doesn't really start to flow for a few years out, but this is when, they, when the Trudeau Liberals have gone after revenue measures, this is what they've done before. Financial institutions and wealthier Canadians, and that's what they've done in this budget again. Okay, and Brian, before I let you go, um, I appreciate that context. Paul was walking us through some of the specifics of this, the fiscal picture. You know, for uh, a government that seemed to be telegraphing the idea of fiscal prudence, to see such a change in the numbers anticipated between the fall update and today, I know you've been pouring over the documents all day. What are some of the takeaways there from your perspective? Yeah, so Finance Minister Christia Freeland is calling this a fiscally responsible budget, but that's going to be in the eye of the beholder here because this is, uh, to my eye at least, a, a risky budget. You've got a declining uh, revenue picture because of a, a economic growth slowdown, and they are pumping billions of dollars into three areas, healthcare, green subsidies, and affordability measures. Most of that money is for health care and green subsidies. And so we knew that the government was going to spend more on health care, the transfers to the provinces. That was announced a month ago. There's a bit of a surprise here in that there's $7 billion for expanding dental care. That's part of the liber liberal agreement with the NDP. So that's part of the agreement that's keeping them in power right now in Parliament, is they are committing over the next five years $7 billion to expanding dental care. And on the green subsidy side, I would say this came in about as we expected. It is $20 billion over five years, but the big thing that I would say about the green subsidies is th th most of the money is in tax incentives, uh, investment tax incentives. So it's, it's capital costs for things like carbon capture systems, for clean power generation, for hydrogen projects. Those tax incentives get a lot richer over time. And we have about $20 billion over the next five years, but by 2034, it's like $80 billion. Most of that money is not in this budget. We're, it's going to start to flow after 2028. And so as time goes on and, and the government says, hopefully this generates a lot of economic growth that helps offset this cost, but those tax incentives are going to get very expensive uh, as we get into the 2030s. All right, that's helpful context, Brian. Thanks a lot. And we knew that the government was going to have to do or felt it would have to do something to counter what we've seen in the United States, at least on some of those tax incentives. But our panel has been patiently waiting, and I want to bring back Nicole Verkent and Carol Stevenson and Sean Spear. Um, Sean, I'm just going to start with you because of the fiscal math here and your reaction to a very different uh, financial picture outlined today than just a few months ago. Yeah, I'd make a couple of comments. First of all, I'm a bit surprised, uh, John, by the, the revenue hit uh, that the government is projecting. Um, uh, listeners and viewers will know we, the, the economy has, uh, has slowed, um, but inflation has also uh, sustained government revenues over the past several months. So if they're projecting an average of a $5 billion decline year over year on, on revenue over the next few years, that's a, a bit of a surprise. Um, but the second thing I'll say, just coming back to my, my opening point about um, the government's ability to hold its line, hold the line on its own spending projections, I would just note um, that in the next couple of years, uh, the projected program spending is going to increase by five or six or seven billion dollars each year relative to what they said in the fall economic statement. And so I think if you're the market, um, if you're market participants, uh, you're going to it's going to lead to questions about whether this government can actually hold the line. Um, whether restraint is possible or whether, as we're seeing in this budget, John, mm. uh, the return to balance just keeps getting pushed further and further. You, as you observe, the fall economic statement uh, identified 27-28 as a year in which we'd get back to surplus. Now that's being pushed out uh, beyond that. And, and so I think that'll be a question that the minister will be getting uh, mm. in the coming days, not just from reporters. Um, but from markets themselves. And look, politics is politics. And Brian Platt was outlining to us the reality that having an alliance with the NDP <clears throat> was going to require some capital to be allocated towards uh, especially dental care. But Carol Stevenson, now we have a story about um, Canada plotting attacks on banks on top of the fact that already we had seen those tax measures, uh, the 2 percent tax on stock buybacks for public companies. That was announced late last year. Now we know that comes into effect January 
January 1st, 2024. And then we, we talked, uh, rounded out a little more detail uh, on, on the changes to the alternative minimum tax. And obviously there are a lot of wealthy uh, individuals who work within uh, the boardrooms of corporations as well. So I'm sure they're going to be talking about all of this. What is your reaction, though, uh, on the corporate front? Yes, we have a big commitment to stay competitive, specifically on a greener future. But what about the holistic picture and reaction to everything we've seen so far today? Well, holistically, I think this is about politics and not about sound economic strategy. And I'm personally disappointed that there hasn't been any discussion so far that we've heard on what are they going to cut. Because in boardrooms, you hear about making strategic choices. And that means that you have to stop doing some things if you're going to add some new things. You can't just keep layering on expense upon expense. So I think from a, uh, if I'm trying to uh, compare this to the corporate world, uh, we have seen nothing on what are they going to cut. And um, I don't disagree with some strategic investments if the green economy is uh, an important thing that they figure will fuel this economy and it will make us more competitive, that's good. But I think some of these smaller measures are, um, uh, I guess I'm gonna call them window dressing, but they're, they, uh, as Sean said, they're not adding an awful lot to the bottom line or the top line. Uh, they're just window dressing and political. All right. Um, uh, as we're also uh, monitoring the commentary from Chris Your Freeland uh, in Ottawa right now, Nicole Verkint, uh, you heard what Sean said. You heard what what Carol said. Your reactions? Well, the fall was not that long ago, and to be yeah. this far off and this different mm. from what they were expecting, I think is a little shocking. And all I keep thinking about is how much is it going to cost to service this debt, especially as we're seeing interest rates potentially continue to go up. Um, there was a comment about the percentage of debt we have compared to other countries, but we're not even really layering in all of that debt we have at the provincial level. So definitely scary. Um, I know that Carol made the comment about the minister wearing green because of money, but she must be wearing green because of these huge green tech investments, which uh, I think is a massive topic that I, I think we need to get into at some point. Okay, well, we're going to keep this conversation going because Perrin Beattie is also joining us with his reaction to this federal budget. He's the president and CEO of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. Perrin, thank you very much for your time. Uh, Carol Stevenson was talking about politics uh, ruling this budget today as opposed to perhaps fiscal responsibility. What was your reaction? Well, it's still very early. Our folks are just returning from the lockup now, so we'll get a full brief from them once they have a chance to, to get back. But what we'd been looking for was a clear focus on growth. We need economic growth. And to achieve that, you have to have an environment that encourages private sector investors to invest their capital. And so far, I haven't seen that clear focus in terms of trying to, to generate the sort of investment growth that we need to see in Canada. And, um, you know, what, what, just compared to what you were hoping for coming into this, because obviously you want Canada to be competitive. Who doesn't want Canada to be competitive? We saw a huge initiative taken to try to make Canada uh, a player in a, in a greener economy and certainly at least uh, relatively competitive against the United States. Uh, uh, Brian Platt from Bloomberg was walking us through over the longer term how big these numbers could be. Uh, and yet you also have a message being sent sent to our banking industry about taxation there, a fresh message to wealthier Canadians as well. Um, so as I asked Carol Stevenson for sort of a holistic view on how the business community reacts to something like this, Perrin, what, what more details are you going to be looking for based on, uh, aside from your headline reaction here? Well, what we see is mixed signals here, obviously. The government had to respond to the Americans IRA uh, it was the Inflation Reduction Act. It was important for them to do that, and they seem to have done so more or less on a pro rata basis, but they're targeting their initiatives, not across the board, but to areas where Canada can be more, more competitive. But what we really need in Canada is a full court press on investment, on productivity, and on growth in the country. So what I would have liked to have seen was a major effort on regulatory reform. I would have liked to have seen the federal government leading and bringing the provinces together in taking down interprovincial barriers to trade. 
I would have liked to have seen more in terms of how do we close the skills gap in Canada to ensure that we have a 21st century workforce. Uh, I'd like to have a clear message sent by the politicians that they're cooling it with the anti-business rhetoric because capital will go where it's welcome. And if, if the message that we're sending is they're not welcome here, they'll go somewhere else. So it's, it's mixed signals so far. So you're saying a budget like this or some of the messaging in this budget could mean capital walking away from Canada? Well, I'm, I'm hopeful not. We'll see. We'll get all of the details. But but it was perhaps a missed opportunity that we didn't see more of a focus on how do we unlock private sector capital? The federal government can't borrow our way to prosperity. It's writing checks on a bank account that, that is already overdrawn. And as a result, then, we need to look to the private sector to make major investments in this economy if we're going to boost the, the growth that we have in Canada. So it means focusing often on areas that are that are comparatively low cost or no cost, like regulatory reform or fixing the skills gap that we have in Canada. But we, we need to have a laser like focus on how do we attract and hold the capital we need in Canada and how do we unlock the potential there in the private sector. Mm. Parent Beatty, thank you very much for your perspective on this breaking news. He's the president and CEO of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. I want to get back to our panel. Uh, Nicole Verkind with us here, along with Carol Stevenson and Sean Spear. Uh, Nicole, you run a business. Um, you heard what Perrin said, um, uh, and you were nodding your head as he was uh, <laughs> making those comments. I tend to agree with what Parambiti says, and I agreed with everything he said. It's hard to do this stuff he said, though, to, to make massive regulatory changes. I mean, it's just so tempting for somebody in a government to add more regulatory, more rules, I mean, just at the very basic level. So I absolutely agree with him, and I think I would say that there's a feeling between business leaders and investors and the government. and. They could throw us a bone, you know, they could just, there could be a sentiment that comes back to business that says, we understand that this is how we're going to pay for things and we need to make the environment more attractive. Carol Stevenson, we do hear this frequently these days, the tension between business and government. Do you feel that? Uh, well, I think, I don't know whether I'd describe it as tension. I would describe it as what I said at the very beginning, which is wanting clarity, uh, because Perrin mentioned the mixed signals, and there's nothing worse in business than getting mixed signals. You know, on the one hand, we want you to invest, we'll make it an attractive investment country. On the other hand, we're going to raise corporate taxes, or we're going to do something to, to the corporate tax regime to make it less attractive. So the mixed signals um, are a huge problem for corporations to to make investment decisions and go ahead and execute on their plans and that is what drives growth uh, in this country so um, I, I agree with Perrin too on uh, these mixed signals I wish that uh, we had a little bit more clarity and maybe in the next few days we'll see it and we're just getting headlines now I, I'm hopeful Look, um, Sean Spear, um, we John. talked earlier about the, the size of this government, and that is a number that won't come out of this budget itself. But we should remind the audience that in the years that the Trudeau government has been in power, we have seen the federal government, the size of the federal government, grow by about 30 percent. Um, I believe the numbers as of last year were something like 336,000. You were talking um, earlier in the program about, you know, the federal government could send a message when it comes to wage negotiations on uh, holding the line on, on things like inflation. But uh, Nicole was talking and, and Perrin was talking about some of the regulatory realities. What happens when you have a much larger government uh, where we didn't see um, uh, uh, truly notable efforts to you know, bring down the size of the deficit? We did see that focus, obviously, on being well positioned for a greener economy. But on this whole subject of being mindful of inflation, would there have been something else you would have been looking for to sort of address that issue longer term? I, uh, I, I ask the question because every day we, we, we kind of turn in the, in the financial markets to what central bankers are doing, but the actions of government alongside with what central banks are doing uh, obviously plays a role in the fight against inflation. Yeah, well, well said, John. Um, you know, I want to be as fair to this government as possible. You mentioned that I previously worked for the prime minister. And I don't want to leave viewers with the impression that I'm motivated by partisanship. I think the government has done a lot of good things over the years. Um, but it has a predisposition to think about its role and the purpose of policymaking to be focused on issues like equity 
or um, making progress on a number of other social issues, all of which are important, but it doesn't seem to have found its voice after all of these years on the question of economic growth. Um, the budget projects, guys, that in the current year, growth will fall to 0.3%. And over the coming years, we're going to have an average of 1.6%, which is even lower than, uh, than it had been projected in the fall economic statement. Canada has a growth problem. Uh, Nicole mentioned productivity being a, a big part of that. George Will, the American columnist, John, likes to say the difference between 2% growth and 3% growth isn't 1%, it's 50%. Canada needs a growth agenda, and one just gets a sense that for various reasons, this government, it's just not part of this government's DNA. And I think that continues to be a major vulnerability, not just for the government, um, but for Canada's economy. All right. And we should point out that uh, when we have high debt loads, uh, a lot of Canadians have high levels of ha household debt, and they're dealing with those interest rate costs. The government has to deal with those borrowing cost realities down the road as well. I do want to talk a little bit more about that fiscal reality. Uh, Manual Life's global macro strategist, Dominic Lapointe, had been in the lockup today. He's been kind enough to join us with his takeaways uh, after uh, having hours to go through the documentation. And Dominic, does feel like um, there is a bit of confusion amongst our panel, maybe on Bay Street, on how what seemed like a path towards a balanced budget has started to become a story of more spending by a big, a big spending government. What, what, what's been your economic assessment of, of what was laid out here by the Liberal government? Yeah, no, it's a fact that we were expecting a balanced budget in, in 2027, and now that has been put to the sideline. But that, that being said, uh, part of that is that the, the economic outlook has been downgraded, right? So they're expecting very low growth uh, in th this year, and, and that lowers their uh, revenue forecast. So, that, so that's why uh, the, the, there's no balanced budget over the horizon. But that being said, uh, the government did not really restrain themselves into uh, promises that they have made before. Before. So all the new spending we were anticipating was all in the budget. So that's why we don't get any balance over the next uh, seven or eight years. Um, and, and I guess just in terms of the, 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 the economic outlook from here, Dominic, um, if memory serves the government, which l let's be clear, if we, if we think about the, the finance minister, you know, she had to deal with COVID uncertainty and then uncertainty around um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine a year ago and now uncertainty around banking turmoil and recessionary fears. Uh, but there has been an environment where sometimes conservative estimates ca can result in more fiscal flexibility uh, if things turn out being better than expected. Is there, is there a case to be made that the projections today uh, end up being too conservative? So I would say the, the opposite, uh, okay. unfortunately. Uh, the, the, for, for 2023 and 2024, actually, we're at, at Manulife, our, our forecast lies somewhere between the government's base case and the pessimistic scenario, which call for an outright contraction in real GDP. And at the same time, if you look at what happened with commodity prices over the past month, if that's sustained, obviously this will have an impact on Canada's terms of trade and lower revenue further. So uh, I would like to make the case is that there's an upside scenario and it's credible, but for us, there's more odds that we get towards the more pessimistic scenario uh, later this year. Dominic, thank you so much for taking the time with us. Dominic LaPointe is with the Manulife economics team. He's been in that lockup all day and tracking the data. Also tracking the data specifically on this big push by the Canadian government to stay competitive with the U.S. Uh, a lot of money being earmarked for the clean tech industry. Someone who knows that well as an investor is Tom Rand, managing partner of Arcturn Ventures, uh, one of our regular guests here on BNM Bloomberg. Okay, you're in the spotlight <laughs> right now, Tom, because everybody knows there's one area where this government wanted to be committed on competitiveness, although there are some specifics here that are going to be different than some of the incentive programs stateside right now. Walk us through your reaction to what the federal government availed today. Yeah, I think they're responding as they, as they must to the Inflation Reduction Act south of the border. Um, for context, that's several hundred billion dollars. Um, it's nominally 380 billion over 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 a decade. It was probably much more than that because there's no limits really to the kind of the investment tax credits and production tax credits that they put out across the board for battery production, uh, green hydrogen production, biofuels, uh, CCS. They, they it's it's really across the smorgasbord of of low carbon tech, and Canada's got to respond to that. 
roughly about a tenth of that would be equivalent to Canada's share, and that's roughly what, what they've done. The question for Canada is, can we carve out a niche in which we're competitive, or is it enough just to match the U.S. and do as you know President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau talked about, which is really building an integrated North American clean energy technology market? And I, I think that's the ultimate goal. But right now, it's kind of tit for tat on the incentive side. So we see, for example, uh, investment tax credits for clean energy machinery, which, as far as I can tell, is aimed at mining equipment. So the notion that Canada can mine these minerals we need for the clean energy uh, industrial revolution and turn them into value-added products and factories is probably pretty smart. However, money doesn't solve that. Red tape and the cutting of red tape solves that, for example. So there's a lot of details as to how we might emerge competitive. But what I see in the budget broadly is trying to match pro rata the U.S. with their with their incentives. And we're roughly doing that, but it's a bit complex because it's not quite apples to apples. Yeah, I think it's worth highlighting for our audience, Tom, as, as you well know, um, there are traditional players within the commodities world, uh, companies based here in Canada that are trying to do their part. They were very eager to know the specifics. And, you know, I had one guest this morning in the lead up to the budget who wanted to see how, for example, the energy industry might react to what was laid out today. Day. What, what would be your best guess on how they're going to feel about what was laid out today? <laughs> well, the energy industry has pretty much dictated climate policy in this country for some time now, and I'm sure they'll be quite happy. I mean, they had enormous amounts of money being being thrown at uh, CCS. That remains the case. The difference between Canada and the U.S. as far as, the, as carbon sequestration goes is Canada, we are spending money on CapEx. In other words, we're paying money for emitters to build stuff, not to succeed in the operation of what they build. Whereas in the United States, they really pay them for success. You capture carbon, you put it underground. So mm. it remains to be, to be seen how that, how that sort of ends up competitive. Um, but there's always been a boatload of money for CCS. Um, and, and I think the growth fund is going to be aimed at bringing political stability to the carbon price. One of the things that's different about Canada is we have a carbon price the United States does not. And so an investor it's hard to compare apples to apples, right? Mm. You have sticks and carrots here. There is just carrots. And so putting political certainty around a price on carbon in case the government comes in and reduces it, contractor difference is what it's called. And that's a lot of what the money in the Canada Growth Fund is, is being geared towards. So there's a lot of detail in terms of how these projects get rolled out. But I, I think we, we put the gauntlet down. The energy industry in Canada should be quite happy uh, with what's there and, and what was there prior as well. Okay, Tom, thanks very much for connecting the dots on this breaking news. We do appreciate it. Tom Rand, managing partner of Arcturn Ventures. There are other parts of this uh, budget uh, announcement that are worth uh, getting back into. Our uh, BNM Bloomberg anchor, Paul Bagnell, has been digging through the documentation. And, you know, Paul, we have um, a few headlines on uh, wealthier Canadians being targeted. We also have more details on that previously announced um, tax uh, or, or, or targeting of stock buybacks by public companies. Uh, walk us through what you've been walking, uh, taking a look at. Yeah, well, let's begin with the tax on share buybacks. That was first announced in the fall update uh, in 2022. The government clearly signaled that it wanted to tax share buybacks by large corporations. The uh, budget 2023, today's budget, John, follows through on that. It does say the tax will apply as of January 1st of 2024. So as of 2024, a tax will apply to the annual net value of repurchases of equity by public corporations and certain publicly traded trusts and partnerships as well. So that tax on share buybacks, which has not been looked upon terribly favorably by investors or companies uh, in Canada, will go ahead. Uh, you, we've already mentioned the taxation on dividends received by financial institutions. Now, this is not uh, a change to the dividend tax credit that individual Canadians uh, benefit from, but it is a big change to the taxation of dividends received by uh, companies, particularly financial institutions. Many of the banks and uh, life insurance companies in this country 
own shares of other publicly traded companies. They receive dividends. They've received beneficial tra tax treatment of those uh, of that dividend income. That's going to change. It's now going to be uh, uh, not treated any longer as business income. Uh, uh, it it uh, will uh, the uh, currently that income is not treated as business income and are effectively ex exempt from tax. It will be treated as business income moving forward. The uh, the uh, budget also uh, proposes uh, or announces changes to the alternative minimum tax. This is a tax aimed at the wealthiest Canadians. Budget 2023 proposes that legislative changes be made to raise the AMT or alternative minimum tax to 20.5% from 15%. Also, it says, however, that the uh, basic AMT exemption, which is exemptly, essentially the threshold at which it applies, gets raised more than fourfold. So it will apply to Canadians who are earning more than $173,000 per year. That's up all the way from $40,000. So, um, uh, that is a, a, an alternative tax that makes uh, that its advocates say make sure that the wealthiest Canadians, quote unquote, pay their share. It's going to be bumped up uh, according to this budget, John. Yeah, and that is a, we'll have to continue. Thank you, Paul. We'll have to continue to look at the specifics on that one too, because that is always a complicated one, isn't it? You know, you think about what is a wealthy Canadian or. or income that you've generated in one year, what if you, you know, sell, I don't know, a cottage uh, and, and all of a sudden that changes uh, your income profile for that year and you're deemed to ultimately be uh, subject to the alternative minimum tax. We'll continue to look at that. Let's uh, get some more reaction to this federal budget. Rana Ambrose joining us, the former interim leader of the Conservative Party, also chair of the Canadian Council of uh, Women CEOs and deputy chair of TD Securities. Uh, Rana, uh, since you do have that familiarity with the energy industry, um, we, we did just yeah. hear from Tom Rand, who said that he thinks, um, you know, in all the noise today, that perhaps there is a bit more clarity for the traditional players based on the roadmap provided today. Would, would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, I would. Look, the energy sector has been lobbying, not lobbying, just meeting nonstop with Krista Freeland, with Jonathan Wilkinson, with the uh, anyone who will listen to talk about the need to create certainty around the carbon pricing, around basically the fallout and consequences of the Inflation Reduction Act when it comes to investments in hydrogen, investments in carbon capture and storage. And we did see some of that clarity here in the budget. So that is a positive for the energy sector. They were looking for um, they were looking for uh, a um, expansion of the tax credit around carbon capture storage. We saw that. We also see 50% uh, refundable investment tax credit for clean electricity. And then of course the 30% refundable investment tax credit for clean technology manufacturing, which is going to be targeting that processing and extraction of critical minerals. I will say one thing, it's the extraction, the processing is important, but we also need to, now that we've got this in place, remind the government how important it is to streamline the regulatory process. Because if we can't get these critical minerals out of the ground, this great tax credit is not going to do much for us. Um, what else is in here that's really important? The carbon contracts for difference is really important to the energy sector. This is something we've seen at the investment bank, basically was going to suck capital out of Canada and into the U.S. when it comes to these large multi-billion dollar carbon capture storage projects because we didn't have the certainty around the carbon pricing. So basically what these contracts for difference do is the government is backstopping the value of the carbon price for the length and duration of the project. Hmm. So people can make the investment knowing that they'll get that carbon price return over time. So that was a really important piece for the energy sector and it's in the budget and there's clarity there and that'll be delivered through something called the Canada Growth Fund, which has $15 billion um, allocated for it. So still some some details around that need to be hashed out. Right. But there was the, the part um, that was most important was the carbon contracts for difference. Now, one other thing really bef quickly before we let you go, thank you for that, Rana. Uh, we've talked through the program about uh, uh, 
in, in this liberal government's years in power, the size of government has grown substantially. I think 30 percent or so since Justin Trudeau um, uh, became prime minister. Uh, the finance minister today uh, essentially defended some of this new spending. Obviously, some of it is directed at you know everything you outlined and staying competitive with the U.S. and all of that. Uh, there was a pledge to reduce government spending on travel and, and outside consultants. Um, but uh, th there's still a big question, obviously, around, you know, what is the right recipe when you're trying to tackle these issues longer term? Uh, certainly no, ta you know, there were some tax increase uh, storylines today or, or taxes being targeted at uh, institutions or individuals. But, you know, Quebec just had a government, uh, a, a budget where they implemented some tax breaks uh, or reduced tax levels for the people in that province. Uh, what do you make of the complications that come with a larger government now that is still, um, it seems, a, a long ways off from getting back to balanced books? Well, you just, the, the complication is you have to raise taxes, right? And that's not anything any individual wants or the business community wants to see is, is taxes going up. But look, you have to you have to um, back up to before this budget and the last budget and the last budget to say, look, even when times were good, this is a big spending government and they've spent too much for too long. And now we're in a situation where we had to respond to a certain extent to what was happening in the United States, the geopolitical environment, the Inflation Reduction Act, a realignment of what's happening in China, Ukraine. I mean, all of this is now become urgent for the government to respond to, but we're now in a weaker economic position in terms of the background. So absolutely, I mean, John Manley was the one that used to always say, and he was a liberal, you make sure you save in good times because in the bad times you're gonna need to spend. And so, and we haven't even hit a recession yet. Yeah. What if, right? So absolutely the good part in this budget is that we are responding to the Inflation Reduction Act. No one wants to see that kind of money being spent where we do need the clarity. And uh, but look, you can't tax your way to prosperity. We all know that. So it is something I think looming large in this budget. And the negative piece of, uh, of the budget is just the large deficit that's that's forecast over the entire horizon. Uh, and, you know, right up till 2020, 27, 28. And we see a higher debt burden mm. and that lands, uh, you know, on our kids and our grandkids. Um, and it means already higher taxes in this budget. Rana, thanks very much for, for joining us. Good to get some time with you. We appreciate it. Rana Ambrose joining us, former interim leader of the Conservative Party, also chair of the Canadian Council of Women CEOs and a deputy chair at TD Securities. I want to bring back some other all-stars that have been joining us through our federal budget coverage, our, our panel here, Sean Spear, Carol Stevenson, Nicole Verkint. Uh, Nicole, we talked earlier about the issue of affordability. I mean, let's not forget a lot of Canadians right now are feeling cash strapped because of you know, not just higher interest rates, but these these inflation realities. There was this one time grocery rebate uh, to provide about two and a half billion in targeted inflation relief. You know, there are other things like this federal alcohol tax, uh, which uh, was going to be increased by six percent. Now it's going to be increased by two percent. So uh, hooray for that, I suppose, uh, for the booze buyers. Um, you know, <laughs> you, you work with a lot of uh, obviously, you, you know, have an intimate familiarity with small businesses, uh, credit card companies are going to be lowering their fees uh, for small businesses. It looks like by 27%. So there are, and we'll go, go through some of the specifics there. But again, um, th the fact that there is um, uh, just the uncertainty, not just for business or, or CEOs, but the uncertainty for smaller businesses and, and the average Canadian right now, do, do you feel like some of those issues get addressed in a budget like this? Oof. I mean, that's a lot. I'm just yeah. hearing a lot of this for the first time, and I'm not sure they do. Um, I, I don't have the details on the grocery rebate, for instance, but it definitely feels like a one-off. Um, there's just, it, it's just what Rana just talked about. I mean, just taking a look at the entire budget and not, not even seeing a path towards a surplus or even getting back to balance. It's, it's kind of looking at the whole picture and I, everyone I know now, it just feels like they're a little frozen. They're just waiting to see what's gonna happen. Is there a recession? One of your guests talked about a recession obsession. Um, you know, what, what everyone feels like they're waiting to see, will interest rates come back down? Um, will inflation normalize on its own? It just feels like we don't have the answer quite yet. Yeah. Uh, Carol Stevenson, um, uh, your, your, your thoughts? 
Well, I'd like to respond to Tom, and I think I should end on a, a somewhat positive note because I feel like I've been a bit negative, but I think there is a wonderful opportunity for Canada and our competitiveness. And we have an entire ecosystem available here that will help the green uh, economy, and it starts with mining. Then you have to process what you take out of the mine. Then you uh, can manufacture build batteries in this country. We have NAFTA, so we can also export vehicles with batteries in them and still get the credit. And so that's an entire ecosystem, and it's something that the U.S. doesn't have. We have the minerals. They don't have the minerals. So, you know, you talk about the boardroom, and you mentioned I was on GM uh, board. One of the things is the supply chain, but I think Canada's got to be smart. Um, you know, in the past, sometimes with oil, we haven't had refining uh, processes in place, so we've dumped our oil or exported uh, more cheaply. If we actually do this ecosystem correctly, it could be a competitive advantage for Canada, but we have to have all the the pieces in in the right places. We mentioned regulatory, but uh, you know, I looked at the um, production credit in the U.S. They get three thousand to five thousand dollars per battery that's manufactured, but it has to be manufactured. <laughs> so um, I just think there's a, a wonderful opportunity for us if we make strategic decisions, which will actually uh, incent the private sector to invest, which will lead to growth. But spreading this all around like peanut butter, um, I don't think it is, is the answer. I love Part peanut butter and it's late in the day and I'm hungry, so, uh, but I get what you're saying. And you'll get a rebate for your peanut butter. <laughs> Uh, listen, I, uh, Sean, I, I do want to uh, uh, run some sound from the finance minister today and, and get your reaction because the, the, the finance minister just, you know, as part of her remarks today, talking about the recovery for Canada. Let's not forget, obviously, we did navigate through the COVID-19 headaches. But mm -hmm. in terms of talking about um, where we are now, she highlighted the growth for Canada within the G7. Let's have a listen to what she had to say. There are 830,000 more Canadians working today than when COVID first hit. We have recovered 126% of the jobs that were lost in those first months, compared to just 114% in the United States. All right, Sean Spear, your, your reaction there? Because look, I mean, in those dark days of COVID, we didn't know it was going to happen, and, and we did have that recovery. But I think a lot of what we're navigating right now, in part, is because of COVID, and, and in part, part of the reaction to COVID. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, Canada took a, a pretty extraordinary path during the pandemic. We, we shot a ton of fiscal firepower at the part part of that um, progress that the minister is talking about reflects that. Mm. Um, the challenge, of course, we don't have a lot of firepower left. Mm. Uh, Nicole mentioned uh, borrowing costs. It's worth noting that in 2021, borrowing costs were about $24.5 billion. By the end of the fiscal planning period, John, 27, 28, it's up over $50 billion. And it's worth noting that's the difference between balancing the budget or not that year. So it seems to me uh, a big challenge going forward will just be as we face these pressures from um, competitiveness, from our health care system, and so on and so forth, to say nothing of a possible recession, uh, we, we just have little fiscal firepower left. Um, and the government is going to continue to face challenges holding the line on spending, which is, I think, the big story coming out of today's budget. Okay. And claims about uh, this time around haven't manifested themselves. Well, I, I, I do want to get some more perspective, uh, panel. Hold uh, ho hold with me here, because Dan Kelly, the president and CEO of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, has been kind enough to join us. And I've, al I've already seen some of his tweets. I, I see a few things that you're encouraged about, but some 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 bigger picture issues that you're still concerned about. Dan, y Dan your reaction. Sure. Well, certainly we share Sean's uh, thoughts about the size of the debt. Uh, the deficits are huge and, and spread as far as the eye can see. No size of a balanced budget at all. 
uh, and huge, huge additional costs every single year. The one of the largest departments in government, of course, is going to be the government, uh, the Department of the Debt. Um, but there is some good news for small business. We are seeing reduction in credit card processing fees. That's been a top issue for small businesses, especially given all of the cost hikes that they have seen, the pressures that they've had and the compression on margins. So lowering the merchant fees that they pay, this is you know by up to 27%, that will provide some important relief for small business owners. Also liquor taxes being kept, uh, the, the escalation being reduced to 2%, good news there. EI premiums, that was also, they, they were expected to rise next year. That, because of the, the, uh, the strength of the Canadian labor force, that doesn't look like it's going to happen. And so uh, having payroll taxes frozen into 2024 would certainly be a welcome thing for a lot of small companies that are really stretched far. Um, and, and I guess, you know, um, at, at the end of the day, uh, in an environment where um, your uh, constituents also have to deal with where the economy goes from here, um, do you feel like this budget, uh, you know, addressed where we could be? You know, we were just hearing about whether or not we have any firepower left, just depending on, I mean, look, you were with us all the time during COVID. We just don't know where the economic road is going to take us, or I, guess, I suppose small business yeah. over the next year and a half. Look, the government has to worry about how much firepower it has left, but so do small business owners. Yeah. Uh, and one of the pieces in that mix is the fact that they're sitting on a, a mountain of, of debt that the business has had to take on just to survive the past three years. A good chunk of that is in the form of a SIBA loan, those loans are coming due. The government-backed loans delivered by the banks are coming due at the end of 2023. Mm. Uh, you have to have it paid off, unless you're, uh, otherwise you're gonna lose the forgivable portion and have to start paying interest. We've asked the government to extend the deadline by one or two years to give businesses a, a little bit longer run runway. That didn't happen in the budget and, and we think is a real missed opportunity for, for small firms. But there's, look, there's a, a variety of smaller positives in the budget, um, but some big worries on the part of Canada's small businesses, the majority of which are not back to pre-pandemic levels of sales. Yeah. Dan, great to have you with us. Thanks very much for your context on this breaking news. Dan Kelly representing a lot of the small businesses in this country. And in our final minutes here, I want to bring back the panel that's been helping uh, stick handle through this federal budget. Carol Stevenson is back with us, Nicole Verkint and Sean Spear. Um, Nicole, mm -hmm. uh, just because you are growing a business right now and you're used to the startup community, and I saw you sort of acknowledging some of what Dan Kelly had to say there about the challenges that small businesses are dealing with right now. You know, what do you walk away thinking about just in terms of the economic road and, 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 and whether the government's essentially got the back of, of businesses that are trying to, to grow in this country right now? Well, Dan Kelly made me more optimistic, and that was great. And I yeah. am an optimist. I'm an entrepreneur. You have to be. And we keep talking about, you know, is the government creating this environment? But at the end of the day, it is Canada. Unemployment is low. Um, we need to attract more talent. We, you saw the minister there talking about attracting more immigration, which is what we're doing. Immigrants are great entrepreneurs and business drivers as well. So I think we have it in us. And maybe this crisis of this big deficit and the bigger deficit we see coming down the line will propel us to make some of those harder, longer term changes that um, a few of us have been repeating over and over again. And, and Carol Stevenson, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've got some upcoming board meetings. You know, do, do these same issues come up as you <laughs> think about things from the 10,000 feet view? Uh, yes, they do. And, uh, you know, I guess the one message uh, I keep thinking about, and, and I am reflecting on board meetings, when we try and uh, transform, as I think the Canadian government is trying to do in terms of industrial strategy, we always have to make choices. And that means that we have to stop doing some things. And I guess I'm a little frustrated in that I didn't hear anything about program review. Um, I don't disagree with some of the choices that have been made. In fact, I think they're good ones. But I think just like inside the boardroom, the government also has to think about if, if we want to do these things and do them well and be successful and be competitive, then we have to do mm. them right and we have to stop doing some things. And I... I'm looking forward to hearing about a program review, and it's got to be more than $7 billion in consulting fees. That's not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and Sean Spear, who I'm sure could, could to talk all day about consulting fees to us, uh, I, suppose, uh, I suppose with our federal budget 2023 coverage, you're getting final words, sir. Over to you. 
Well, I, I think today's budget, like a lot of the provincial budget we've seen over the past several weeks, uh, if I had to give it one word, it's probably boring, boring, John, that we won't be talking about this much in the coming days. And that reflects in part the economic environment in which we're operating. There's just less money available for big, audacious spending ideas. And uh, depending on what you think about these issues, that may or may not be a, a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but I, I suspect this budget doesn't have a long tail. Um, and we'll get back to politics as usual in Ottawa, no doubt. No doubt. And uh, it's so, been so great to have all of you with us uh, as we've covered this. Uh, I want to thank you all again, uh, Nicole Verkint and Carol Stevenson and Sean Spear. Deeply appreciative of your insight on every aspect of this federal budget. Uh, folks, I should also note that on our website, we've got some great coverage, bnmbloomberg.ca. Please check it out as part of our continuing coverage of federal budget 2023. And I do want to thank all the guests beyond our panelists who have joined us through the hour, as well as our own Paul Bagnell, our Bloomberg partners, uh, and of course, our hardworking crew at BNM Bloomberg. Plus, thank you, as always, for joining us. It's been great to have you with us. We appreciate your viewership. This wraps up our coverage of Federal Budget 2023.